Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on markerless gate analysis. So my name is uh, Niels Betzler. I'm Product Manager Life Sciences at Qualysys. And um, I've joined Qualysys about 10 years ago with various roles, more focused on development, and now moved to product management. And I'm really glad that I'm joined by um, Marcus from uh, Thea Markerless. Thank you for joining us, Marcus. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes. Um, so my name is Marcus, and I am the Director of Technology at Thea. I've been working on a variety of projects um, for, that include uh, large data analytics for many years. And for the last two years, I've been specifically focusing on marketless technology. And I would also like to thank Niels um, for organizing this and having me here. And uh, I've been working with Niels for approximately 10 years, and it's been um, quite fun. So thank you very much, Niels. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I'm also glad that we've got um, some more help with us from our demo team, Vincent um, over in Sweden and Stan, who will be helping us with the demo. And we also have Libor on our um, chat who will be answering your questions. So let's uh, dive right into the topic. Um, so um, I hope you uh, have all seen the GoToWebinar um, control panel, please um, use it to uh, ask any questions that you might have and also adjust your audio settings in case you can't hear us. At the bottom, there is um, a box where you can um, enter questions and either Libor on the chat will answer during the webinar and then we'll also answer some of the questions at the end of the webinar. So um, if you don't get a reply right away, we'll do our best to answer at the end. Or um, if uh, we run out of time, which has sometimes happened because there are so many questions, um, we'll be sure to get back to you by email. Um, okay, as a short introduction, um, I would like to talk about the hardware that we have available at Qualysys for um, markerless and marker-based motion capture. So um, down at the bottom, you see the OCUS and MICUS cameras, which are our marker-based um, standard platforms. And I know many of you are using today, um, and um, that's quite a well-known technology. And then um, maybe around one year ago, we've looked more and more at the markerless options as well. And um, we have the Mikus video camera, which can be used for markerless. And um, earlier this year, we launched the hybrid camera, um, which it has two modes where you can switch between marker recording or video recording. So that's obviously ideal to sort of future proof your lab. And um, today we'll be focusing on what you can do with the hybrid and video camera in terms of markerless capture when um, using Thea for my data processing. So the hardware setup looks very similar to um, what it normally looks like for a mocap system, except that obviously all the cameras have to be video or hybrid cameras. And um, because of the amount of video data, um, it also means that um, there's, some, there's some special hardware um, required, a 10 gigabit ethernet switch and a powerful computer because otherwise the markerless processing would take very long. Um, and um, with that setup, um, you will be able to simply calibrate like you always do with a marker-based um, setup. And also the time synchronization will be just the same as for a marker-based setup. So the advantage of that is that you can add force plates, EMG, analog data, just like you would normally do in a 3D mocap setup that is marker-based. And um, we believe this is a fairly unique um, setup that we can offer today, um, where you have the full, full capabilities of all our integrations combined with markerless motion capture. And then if you're using the hybrid camera, you can even still use the whole system as a normal marker-based system for maybe some of the more advanced or more traditional analyses. Um, so, and today we'll show a workflow that we have developed with our gate analysis module. So what do we mean by analysis module? It's um, basically a module that we offer as an add-on to the Qualysys QTM Track Manager software to streamline the workflow from data collection to modeling to report. So it's really to save time so that you don't have to run scripts manually, you don't have to give specific file names and so on. You can just easily create reports and process data in a very efficient manner. We've got modules available for gate running, baseball, golf, cycling, equine, and functional assessment today. Today, the focus will be on gate, of course. And within the gate module, um, we have a choice of marker sets available today. IOR, CAST, and CGM. 
And um, we're also adding the, the possibility to um, have the CGM2 marker set, which we are about to release um, and where, that we covered in a previous webinar. There's a recording available on our website if you're interested in that. And then we have one more, well, marker set in quotation marks, which is markerless. So within the same module, we'll be able to um, simply um, run data collection um, without markers and do the processing through Thea. And that's what we'll show today. So the workflow works like that. You record the data um, with QGM, then tracking is done in Thea, where biomechanical processing is done in Riddle 3 d and the report is will appear on our web platform where you can review it. Um, or of course, you could also review the data in Riddle 2 d already if you prefer a more traditional um, sort of paper-based report. Um, we have one customer um, today that I want to highlight um, in Austria that is already running Thea on a routine base. Um, they will start up with this streamlined workflow that we show today very soon. And um, right now they use Thea and they have to just copy some files and then run a few steps manually. So the workflow that we showed today will help them to streamline this. They have been extremely active uh, running several analyses per week, often several per day. And um, to be, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I was, myself surprised how seamlessly and easy um, they were able to run the system in this, uh, in this setup um, because this was one of the first times I saw a, a setup like this uh, um, early this year. So um, that's we're really happy to, to have them on board and we are looking at other cases of course at the moment to um, further test this setup in a clinical setup. Um, now it's time for us to move on to uh, a demo. So I'm Glad that uh, Vincent is available for that together with Stan. So um, I will hand over to them in a few seconds. Um, here we go. So we'll switch over to Vincent's screen. Yes. There we are. And thank you, Vincent, then you can take over. Okay. Thank you, Nils. And hi, everyone. Uh, today I'm in the studio uh, at Qualesis in Göteborg. Uh, Gothenburg, sorry, uh, in, in English, and uh, I'm with uh, Stan here. Uh, so we're going to show you quickly how the workflow uh, works uh, as it is right now uh, with like a, a live demo. So if you see the screen that uh, if you see the screen that I'm sharing now, you have QTM open and you have the left uh, panel where you can uh, create uh, a patient. So that's the standard panel that you use uh, in our gate module. So you create a patient with a patient ID. You add a name. So it's going to be Stan. And let's call him webinar. <laughs> let's give him a birth date. So the height of Stan and the weight. Um, uh, sorry, it's the height is 180 and the weight is 85. So the weight it will be used to normalize the data in the end in the web report. And you press OK. Then you click on Add and you will add a clinical gate session. And you press OK again. And once you're here, as Nils described before, you have all the different like sessions that you can uh, that you can use in our gate module and in this new product that we will release, like Neil said in September, you will have the possibility to run a markerless session. So I'm going to select that one and press OK. The workflow is now to record the data. So I'm going to ask a stand to uh, stand uh, close to the force plate uh, because the first step is to record the static. Uh, so maybe I can switch to the view. Here, so you have Stan in uh, in the studio. Uh, we are using eight cameras with four plates and EMG. So I'm gonna start the capture. And uh, I'm using like a trigger so to start and stop the capturing. So I'm gonna press now. So now the static trial is recorded. So the only thing that you can see, it's of course the video because there is no markers. And then you can switch to uh, recording the gate trials. So today we're gonna record two gate trials in, uh, two, in both directions. So I'm gonna 
simply click on the capturing for the first gate trial. And then soon the trigger will appear where I will start the measurement using the trigger. You can walk then. I'm starting the measurement and then I'm gonna stop it now. Perfect. So the second, the first trial, uh, gate trial is recorded. You can look at the video files if you want to. So you have also, you see the force plates, the force data. You can see some uh, overlay if you want to with the overlay on the, on the video. And now what I can do, I can record the second trial. So it's the same procedure as uh, before. I'm gonna wait for the system to be ready and I'm gonna ask Stan then to start working soon. You can walk Stan. Okay. So now we have two recordings. Two gate recordings. So now uh, the workflow you see is very simple and what you have to do now is to follow the steps that are under the start processing button. You have four steps to guide you. Uh, the first one is to initiate TI. So TI is the software that we use as Nils mentioned to uh, solve a model and solve the skeleton uh, based on uh, machine learning. Uh, I guess uh, Marcus will talk about it uh, just after. So now we have TIA open. And then what we can do, we can start the TIA processing. And uh, I think Marcus, you can take over now and explaining a bit what's happening. Sure, thank you, uh, Vincent. That's a very nice demo. So the first step of the end, this will go very quickly, so I will try to describe it as best I can, is um, we're first going to identify where people are actually located within the scene. So within the scene, there's the there's the laboratory, there's a force plate, there's the primary subject here, which is Sten, and then there's also potentially people in the background or other people that are interacting in the scene. So our first step is to actually figure out where there are people. And there you can see there's a detection around Sten in the uh, viewer. After this, what we do is we actually determine where some key anatomical features are located. So for Sten, some key features could be his eyes or the tip of his toe or um, his elbows, for instance. So those, those two steps are now finished. So following this step, the, sec the next step is to actually resolve which person is which within the volume. So we actually determine who is Sten uniquely within every single view. Following that, we run an inverse kinematics uh, uh, solver, and that is what we actually save to our um, C3D file. So the first trial is actually now finished, and we're now about midway through the second trial. So um, that's kind of the processing time that uh, we would expect given the computer that Qualysys uh, delivers. Um, a few uh, niceties about this uh, setup is that, as you can see, it's fully automatic and integrated with the um, the Qualysys uh, calibration. So they currently are we currently are reading the calibration, analyzing the videos, but there isn't any um, user intervention that is actually required uh, to per perform the analysis. is completely automatic. So now we have the second trial that is um, complete, and we're just running the static trial now. It's almost finished as well. So the output from this is a standard uh, C3D file that um, you can load in Visual 3D or uh, and, and look at what we're actually saving. And that is what um, Qualysys is using for the report. So that is the entirety of the analysis uh, from FIA. And you can see that it's now finished. So I can give the um, mic back to Vincent, who will complete the uh, remainder of the analysis. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Marcus, for the nice explanation and the clear explanations. So like uh, like Marcus just said, the TIA processing is done. So it was step two. And now we, we're going to run the step three, which is the running the biomechanical analysis for gate. So I'm going to um, 
I'll click on that one and uh, our Visual 3D pipeline is going to be running for a few seconds uh, using the C2D file from TIA and the C2D file from QTM that contains the analog data for both the EMG and, um, and uh, the false plate data. So as you can see, there is no errors and no warning, so we can click on OK. And if you want, of course, also you can look inside Visual 3D uh, and see, for instance, if I select probably the first one here, you can see if I press play, you will see the model that we have been importing from, um, from TIA output. And if you want, you have also a report, but I will uh, I, I would prefer to just click on the on uh, the last step because what we would like to promote today it's also the 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 possibility to output uh, the data and the results to our online report. So I'm going to click on this last step. This last step will open Visual Studio again to export uh, the results in the file that can be uploaded to the report. And at the same time, uh, it will uh, encode the videos uh, that uh, have been used uh, during those gate trials. So people in the report can look at the curves, look at the graphs, see the 3D viewer with the skeleton, and also look at the videos. Uh, so to be able to have like a big, uh, like a good overview of uh, the gate analysis. And uh, so it's going to take uh, a bit of uh, a, a few seconds, uh, maybe around one minute, I would say, because right now we have a lot of videos to encode. But for the release, we will give the the possibility to we will give the possibility to the user to uh, select the videos they want to see. And the report has been generated now. Uh, and I think now, Nils, if you want to uh, take over and present the report, uh, you can do it. Sure, great. I'll switch back to my own screen here. Um, here we go. So I'm also logged into our online report center. And I'll simply refresh now. And um, you can see that uh, nine minutes ago, we recorded another session here, which is the one that Vincent just recorded. And because the whole um, report um, system is running as an online service, I'm just able to go show this on, on my own computer now. And when I um, click on view, we can see the report. And within that, um, we are using the same template that we use for the marker-based report. So um, there is a 3D viewer where we can sort of see the skeleton. The videos views are uploaded. Um, where just as Winston said, and make an option available to only upload the ones that you are interested in, and not all of them. Um, there's an indicator indicating where you are um, when you're looking at the data. You can add annotations, um, review the data, and um, all the um, standard joint angles, and because of the integration of the force plates, um, we do have the kinetics available as well. Um, and um, then obviously ground reaction forces, um, upper body, and um, also the EMG data, because we were using EMG in this session. Um, we were not able to do very much in terms of skin preparation here, so the, the data quality here is a little bit poor, but um, we were keen on showing this um, as well, that the EMG data is just seamlessly integrated um, from um, the, the wireless EMG here. Um, there are other options available in, in the report platform that could probably cover a complete webinar session. Um, one of them is to create comparison reports. And um, we have recorded some data where we recorded with markers simultaneously. I'll just jump over to that report here. Um, and um, in that session, we have used the cast marker set and the um, fear tracking. Um, simultaneously, um, not so much as a formal validation study at this point, but more as a proof of concept and um, to gain some experience. And we'll describe our results here in a small tech note that we can send. Um, but Marcus will also talk more about validation, ongoing validation work. And um, what you can see overall is, um, unfortunately, the lines are fairly thin here, but you can see dashed lines, which are the cast model, and thick lines, or solid lines, which, which are theater tracking. And in several of the joints, we we have an extremely good overlap. Um, both the two models that are used use a very different knee model, um, so there's a big difference here. 
Um, I would say that the truth is somewhere in between the two. Um, but there's also some ongoing work on the on the knee joint, Marcus has told us earlier. So um, we see these results very encouraging. And also, I think it's really important to stress um, what we are looking for from my perspective. Um, it's not so much something that completely replaces marker-based analysis, but it's um, something that allows you to run more objective analyses um, for patients or for persons where you normally wouldn't be able to use a 3D analysis because of the um, the demands on putting on the markers or because the patient or the person doesn't like to have markers on their body um, or because there's simply no time because it's just a clinic where um, patients just walk in and out. Um, and um, this offers the ability to do this assessment. You could see that, I mean, we took this recording fairly slow. You could probably get to that report even quicker um, without any intervention in between. And another thing um, that's important here is that, of course, that this gives more time to analyze the data and to talk about the results, to think about the results rather than doing repetitive steps um, like uh, putting sticky tape on markers. Um, okay, so with this, we are getting towards the topic of, um, of validation and comparison to marker-based data. And I also saw there were several questions on that. Um, so I'm really glad that uh, Marcus will be sharing some of the results um, on comparison and accuracy in the next few minutes. So over to you, Marcus. Thank you, Niels. That was a um, very nice presentation. So. As Niels described, this method for measuring human motion really is an objective me uh, method. So to assess the quality of this, we've done quite a significant um, validation study that involved uh, over 30 subjects doing a variety of different tasks. In addition to that, we have ongoing validation um, regarding the repeatability of this method and also the accuracy of spatial temporal parameters. So that's what I'm gonna be presenting here. And I don't have the slides, it's Neil's actually running the slides. So if I tell him to go back and forth, just don't worry about that. So this is, a, this is a, an example of our lower body kinematic results from one particular subject. So this is pulled from our validation study that, that does have 30 subjects. So we're just showing one representative subject. So here, what we have is the mean for 10 trials from both marker-based and markerless. The red is the marker uh, list and the blue is the marker base. So this is just represents one individual subject. So if we look at these graphs here, we see the um, flexion extension, the primary uh, joint angle is on the left and then the tertiary or the secondary and then the tertiary in those in the subsequent columns. And what we see here is that for both systems, we actually have, they, it actually looks good and it actually, um, makes sense in terms of what's actually happening anatomically during a walk. Um, we also see for the for flexion extension, we are very similar in, um, in all of the uh, lower limb kinematics that we're looking at. Um, and that's also true for the uh, secondary axes here. And the tertiary axes are less consistent, but still within the same, um, certainly within the same region for both systems. Um, so that is, uh more broadly describes how our validation is going now this only describes for walking because it's very repeatable however we have a significant number of different exercises that we are uh, validating and this will all go into um preprint very shortly this is the analysis is uh, more or less finished um and just to extend on that uh, a little bit the data that we actually input into this so niels was describing that here our knee model um for this data set actually um, has been extended. So because we augment our models and the raw data stays the same, so we, we use the same video data, as our models augment and as our models improve, then you can simply reperform the analysis from previous collections and you, it, there isn't a rigid set because the raw data is consistent, um, independent of how our modeling and how our, uh, how our data changes. So that is um, the marker base versus marker list. The next um, part I'd like to look at is the repeatability between different conditions, because this is really what interests me. It, um, if we basically have the same person that has been unaffected and is should be functioning the exact same, when we get them into the lab on different occasions, do they exhibit the same behavior? So can we measure differences or can, I think more accurately, can we measure the same behavior from the same person? So th these are nine subjects. So the, um, the assessment is somewhat limited because uh, the number of subjects is, is limited, but here you can see examples of different uh, clothing types. So in the top left, you see this is three different subjects, or sorry, three of the same subject wearing different clothing on different days. So 
that's exactly it, where Niels is highlighting. So these are just um, triplets of the same subject and the different clothing they wore. Now, when we looked at the reliability of the different collections, which is on the next graph, the next page, what we found was uh, was quite um, was very interesting. So, what you're looking at here are the lower limb kinematics for um, three. So this is for one representative subject for the three different sessions. So on these graphs, there are three means and three standard deviations. And what we see is actually that we're measuring effectively the exact same thing, independent of what the subject is wearing or when they actually come into the lab. Now we see a little bit more. Uh, we see a little bit more variability in the data in the um, in the tertiary uh, joint angles. However, that's kind of expected, and we see that in both uh, marker-based and uh, markerless motion capture. The following slide actually kind of describes this variability a little bit better, and really, this is the most fascinating part of the data. So, what we're looking at here are the error, um, the inter-trial, and the intersessional error. So the line that is the dotted line describes the variability that's intrinsic to measuring within one session so for instance we may have 10 strides within a, 10 strides within a session and for every stride they aren't actually walking the exact same so we get we get variability in that measurement itself when we compare that variability to the variability between sessions we see the same thing which to us indicates that we aren't introducing differences as a result of collecting the data on two separate instances which is really important if we're trying to detect differences between uh, different conditions or trying to detect whether a rehabilitation process is working um, properly. So that effectively covers the reliability and the marker-based um, uh, comparison. So another comparison, which we, which was actually the first one we did, but is the um, probably least involved because we're just looking at uh, temporal spatial gate cram uh, parameters was a, it's currently in preprint, so we can provide where this is uh, located. But effectively, what we did was we measured the differences between uh, the spatial temporal parameters measured using a marker based system and the markerless system. And the, to summarize the results, they're effectively the same. The only difference that we did find was with uh, toe in and toe out parameters, which, as I mentioned earlier, was actually resolved by introducing more anatomical features to our uh, markerless detection. Um, and for, in terms of the differences, any difference that we did measure here, which were any were small, could be attributed to a one frame difference in the kinematic gate events. Now, we are well aware that marker based motion capture is not the uh, gold standard in terms of doing uh, temporal spatial uh, parameter measurements. So we are augment, augmenting this with the gate right map and we'll, um, we'll update the preprint. So that effectively covers the validation studies that we're currently doing. And the validation studies are ongoing and um, are very uh, involved. So they're done by a third party uh, laboratory by third party university, Queen's University. And um, we hope to have these preprints and many more preprints um, available so everyone can understand just the capabilities of the system. Great, thank you, Marcus, perfect. Um, yeah, I think, um... Very interesting, very encouraging results. Um, there will probably be some questions about these. And I mean, we're really happy to follow up by email um, because I know that every lab and every potential user has different questions about this and different demands. So um, uh, we are very happy to get in touch about that. And I know, Marcus, you're very open to share your results and your findings so far about what works and what, what maybe doesn't work um, as good yet. Um, Overall, um, in summary, um, I would like to summarize that um, we're offering a streamlined workflow from according to web report. So it's just a few mouse clicks. It's uh, no more tweaking of complicated settings and so on, um, and no knowledge of markerless uh, tracking theory or anything is required. Um, so um, we have a nice, easy workflow. Um, it's a, for us a, an ideal complement to marker-based analysis. And we know that many labs have asked for adding video analysis capability to their marker-based system. And I really think this is adding that capability or actually merging um, both um, possibilities into a single system. And um, we calibrate simply with a wand. And there's no checkerboard that you have to wave in front of the cameras or anything like that. So for anyone who knows our system and um, doesn't have to learn anything new, it's uh, quick and easy. 
Um, we have the synchronization with force plates and EMG, which is still the same as with marker-based cameras and offers a lot of possibilities, whether it's any of the major EMG or force plate systems that you can add. Um, and from September, um, this will be available as part of our um, gate module. And the clinical gate module, which is specifically uh, for clinical use, um, will have to wait a little bit longer because um, we'll be, we're working on the um, uh, regulatory aspects here as well to make sure that this can be part of a medical device as well. Um, but beta testing is already possible. So um, if you're interested, um, get in touch. Um, we'll be in touch with the, our uh, friends in Austria next week to set up the, the workflow in their lab. And anyone else who's interested in that, please let us know. And um, we will, of course, also look at other applications, but have started with the gate as the main focus. Um, we'll have, have several resources available on the webinar page, as usual, also recording. And with that, I would like to really thank you for joining us today. And we will take um, our time now for some questions. Um, some of them, I think, are already answered on the chat, but I also saw several that uh, we'll be answering now. So um, we'll do our best to answer all. Um, anything that is not answered, we'll answer by email. And I would say we have another 10 to 15 minutes for that. Um, so if you can stay a little bit longer, um, then um, that will be great. Um, I just had a glimpse here at the question, and I think uh, there are plenty of questions for you, Marcus. Um, yes, there are quite a few. I'll just... Um, I can start going down the list, and if anyone has, or uh, you know, see if you want to moderate and add more flags, yeah. I can continue to, um, to respond. So the first question here is, how are the knee ankle axes determined? If the patient has rotational deformities, how would this be captured? So this is a really interesting question. So when we actually... Um, do our feature detection um, without giving up too much information that's unfortunately proprietary. We are effectively tracking um, individual um, features on the body as though they are markers. So when we're actually defining things, we are tracking even if there are rotational uh, deformities, we are locating those individual salient points that represent that feature. We are uh, locating those on a frame by frame basis. So the deformities, as long as they look and represent what would, um, let's say, be uh, like in terms, it would look like an actual person. So, it, you know, a leg from my leg would look very similar to basically anyone's leg. If, as long as they look like a person's leg, then we will capture effectively the same features and then we will measure the rotational deformities. If I don't answer these questions uh, adequately, let me know in the chat and I will continue because there's quite a few questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, then there's a question about uh, analyzing other joints and perhaps we should highlight here that we are showing a workflow here where we've, we've integrated Thea specifically for gate analysis. Um, but of course, Thea is a generic software. But the part of the question that I'm interested in myself, Marcus, is could you do it for partial analysis of only the arm, for example, or is it more full body? So it, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. So basically, if we can only see the upper body, we will only track the upper body. Um, my guess is that the tracking would actually be better if you could see the whole body because there's an interesting thing that happens um, when you're analyzing these uh, images and that there's implicit relationships that are developed um, and are used in our, uh, in our deep learning networks that seeing other parts of the body actually improves your tracking for this part of the body. So let me give you an example. So I'm just gonna, so if I hold my hand here and I put my hand behind my head, now you can't see my hand, but you know where it is based on where my uh, shoulder is and where my elbow is. So there's all these interesting implicit relationships that actually um, we don't actually define within our models, but um, become apparent. So the partial analysis to get to get back to that is certainly possible. Um, and as long as there is some good depth of features, there uh, the analysis will occur. So whether it's a lower body or an upper body analysis, is uh, they work just the same. However, my recommendation would be to use the full person if possible. Mm -hmm. And then the same applies probably to another question here. Is it possible to do um, finger tracking? Exactly. So our hand model is currently in beta. So currently we have our full body, our full body model that runs on every single frame. And then we also have a 22 joint hand model that we're going to be uh, releasing as well, um, which is not uh, totally complete, but if anyone has any further interest in, in the hand model, please uh, email either uh, Niels or I, and we, can, um, and we can address those individually. But yes, the, uh, we can, although it's somewhat uh, not related necessarily to the webinar that we're doing. So I, I wanna move on from that a little bit. 
Yeah. Um, there were some questions um, about frame rates as well. And uh, maybe I'll give a, a reply from the quality side, and then you can uh, give a reply from your side, <laughs> Marcus. Um, sure. I mean, the first part about frame rate, the first question is, of course, what f frequency you use for recording. And that is um, set by the capabilities of the um, Mikus video camera, which means we can record 85 hertz at full HD. Um, and we can then reduce um, and have a higher frame rate at 720p, for example. So that's really sort of the, the, the range that we have. I think we can go up to uh, 100 or 200 hertz um, with a lower resolution. And uh, Marcus, maybe you can add um, to that how much that will affect the tracking and also how um, if there are certain limitations on the resolution. Right, so in terms of the frame rate, um, to start with that, if it's gonna be somewhat analogous to marker-based uh, motion capture. So if, you're, if we require a high frame rate to actually measure that motion so if we're doing a very fast motion then there needs to be a frame rate so that uh, a frame rate that's adequate so that we don't attenuate the signals that we're actually measuring um mm -hmm. so in this case they use 50 hertz we typically use 85 hertz when we're running the our mica system um however for faster motions obviously you need um faster frame rates so you'd have to do a reduction in the uh in the resolution um, that being said, with the we also require a certain resolution. So what we our recommendations are that the person that you're actually measuring is between four and five hundred pixels. So as we get down to a really small resolution, let's look at the limits of this. Where let's say, for instance, we were measuring a person that was fifty pixels, well, we wouldn't be able to accurately measure joints very well. So our uh, general guide is to use about forty to or uh, four hundred to five hundred pixels for that person measurement, and then we can. Um, produce reliable results. So it's kind of a combination of frame rate as well as reducing the sensor size so that you can mm -hmm. actually um, achieve that capture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Marcus. So I think it's a very good point there to just see that this, understand that this is somewhat similar to the marker based analysis, where, of course, if you cannot see individual markers very well anymore, the resolution is not sufficient. And then it's sort of really um, a good motivation for us to increase uh, frame rates even further and um, so that we can collect data at, uh, at high high frame rates and um, for very fast sports movement for example but i mean having said that i mean we have collected data for fast movements as well and um, the tracking um wasn't had, there was no negative effect there um on faster movements and um, when performing acceleration runs for example or jumps um so i think there are a lot of options that are already available um at the range of 100 to 200 hertz um Another interesting question here was, um, how well does the Markerless method work for overweight overweight persons? Very good question, very interesting question. So it really comes back to effectively the exact same um, problem that we were just talking about with respect to um, with respect to the person size. So effectively what we're looking at here is we're trying to determine salient features. We're trying to determine features that exist on the body. Now. If you look at the image and it's easy for you to determine where those uh, features are located. So a good example would be the big toe. So if you can look at the image and see where that big toe is located, then our model is probably going to do slightly better job than you just looking at it, given the amount of data we've actually input into our model. That being said, when you get to um, overweight subjects or not necessarily overweight subjects, or if I was just wearing a baggy coat, for instance, the amount of error associated with where my joints are actually located just increases a little bit. So there is a little bit more ambiguity in terms of where different joints are located, for example, the hips um, for overweight subjects, but those also only apply to certain joints. So if we're looking at, for example, the foot tracking or we're looking at the, the shank, then those features would be very visible for um, overweight subjects or uh, non-overweight subjects. So I wouldn't imagine that it would be a problem there. However, we do introduce a little bit of ambiguity when um, assessing the locations of the joints that are just a little bit uh, trickier to find. Now, it's again, totally analogous to um, putting on markers on uh, overweight subjects. So when instrumenting an overweight pelvis, it's very difficult to find the anatomical features. And we effectively, um, we have that same challenge with uh, using the video images. Mm, yeah, I can imagine. And I think it would be very interesting to look at uh, like clinical validation studies there. And um, there was also a question about um, whether you've tested the system with pathological gait or simulated pathological gait. I believe you've done some of that, but I also think we'll have some interesting projects coming up later this year to set yeah. up the system actually in a hospital setting, running in parallel to the marker-based sessions um, to really get a good comparison on like sort of real patient data where you maybe have another person helping. But um, I, my 
think my hope is and my I'm quite optimistic about that because um the the tracking and what from what we have seen has been very um very um, capable of that if you have another person in the in the room for example and related to that there was a question about gaps um if there are um what if they if there can be gaps in the data if uh, um, an anatomical landmark is occluded um perhaps you could comment on that as well markers um, sure. So effectively, um, if there is a total occlusion from in all the views where we can't actually see the uh, the anatomical feature in enough views to resolve the skeleton, then there is there will be a gap and it's possible to fill that. However, if we do have an occlusion in one view, for instance, and we have good visibility in other views, then the occlusion actually isn't um, isn't a problem. The difference between our system and a traditional market based system is that we can guess no matter where the, the joint is actually located. So using the exact same analogy I used before, my hand is behind my head like this, I can guess where my wrist is pretty accurately. So once we have an occlusion of that, it's actually not a problem because we I'm, I didn't describe it very uh, well during our analysis procedure. However, we do have a pretty um, strenuous outlier detection protocol that we run on our joints to determine which joints we can actually see well and which joints we can actually uh, that are actually included that we have a, a less good idea of where they're located. I, I think that answered the question. If it doesn't, then ask mm -hmm. it again more specifically and I'll try again. Yeah, and I, I sorry, Marcus, I didn't really give you a chance to answer about uh, testing on pathological gait. Um, I, I could just say what we are planning. Um, can you add? Do you want to add anything on that for um, simulated pathological gait or? So like we that? haven't done anything simulated with respect to pathological gait. We've uh, we've done some uh, initial testing on um, uh, children with cerebral palsy, and it kind of come, comes back to the exact same. Um, it comes back to the exact same point. So in fact, uh, my assessment of the tracking would be that it, it actually runs very well because the anatomical features are very visible and that is the most um, important part of our tracking is whether or not those anatomical features are visible which is certainly the case with um, uh, definitely um, uh, kids with cerebral palsy so to extend on that um, we are hopefully going to be doing something a little bit more strenuous I think Niels would uh, would you like to discuss that a little bit here um, yeah, I mean, we are working towards having um, a system set up at a hospital at a, at a hospital as well um, to really run alongside with marker-based tracking um, on real patient data. Obviously, there are various steps that have to be done first, um, ethical approval and so on. But once we get to that point, I'm, I mean, I'm really looking forward to that, uh, to, to see um, the results and how it's also how it uh, works in a, in a daily routine. Um, but I'm very optimistic about that. Um, then maybe to just wrap up, um, and I'm sorry that we can't answer all questions here. As I said before, we will um, run through the list um, after the webinar and answer. But there are some specific questions I would like to pass on to you, Marcus, here um, about the um, the tracking algorithms. Um, one is, sure. is this specifically trained for gait? Yeah, so that, I mean, great question. So it, it isn't. So we're using that currently as the application, um, but it is not trained for gait at all. So it's just trained on completely generic and we are just using gate as the um, uh, for one it's well studied and it's also very cyclical. So in terms of measuring something that's repeatable and you're doing very consistently gate is a is a good candidate for that and it's also um, a nice module that Qualsys provides. So this is kind of our beginning, but it doesn't, it's not, um, we never uh, describe the motion to uh, Thea and we also um, are able to analyze a, a wide variety of motions beyond just um, what you've seen here. However, for the module that I'm presenting now, it, it does uh, work for gate. Yeah. Um, and then there, we also had a, some more very technical questions about the uh, training here. Um, what time of what time what type of networks were used and so on? But I think it's better if we um, answer this by by Great. email afterwards. Um, we've reached our sort of time limit here. Um, I'm really looking forward to your discussions um, outside this webinar. Um, we would like to thank you very much for joining. I would like to thank Marcus for type, taking the time very early in the morning in Canada for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you to the team in, in Gothenburg and also to Libor for answering all the questions. And um, yeah, let's uh, keep in touch and keep an eye for our next webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.